Hi, my name is Cameron Miller and this is Trinity Place in Geneva, New York. And this is a reflection for the fifth Sunday of Lent and the readings from the Revised Common Lectionary, which were Isaiah and John. And the story about Jesus that uh, we have uh, getting a therapeutic massage is one of the few stories about Jesus that is actually included in all four Gospels. Isn't that amazing? All the stories you can think of about Jesus, and this is one of the few that is in all four Gospels. I mean, the idea that his mother Mary is a virgin, well, that's not in all four Gospels. The idea that Jesus was born in a manger is not in all four Gospels. Even Jesus appearing to somebody after the resurrection is not in the four go all four Gospels. So when a story like this one appears in all four of the Gospels, we have to imagine that it is part of the bedrock of the Jesus stories that was told from the very beginning. And I'm sorry there's noise coming through here. It's construction going on out in the street of beautification, uh, which is great. Anyway, uh, Mark's version, so all four Gospels have this story about Jesus getting uh, the massage, um, but each version is a little bit different, and Mark's version uh, is quite different from the one we had today in John's Gospel. Uh, Mark's version, of course, is earlier than John's by about 25 to 40 years, we're not sure, but that's a lot of time for a story to travel and pick up changes. And it's instructive to uh, compare these two stories and ask ourselves questions about the differences. Now, first of all, in Mark, the massage takes place in the home of a leper, whereas in John, it's at a relatively well-off domicile uh, belonging to Lazarus and his sisters. Secondly, in Mark, the woman remains nameless. She was not part of the inner circle, and she does not even get the respect of a name. Now, that may be, mean that nobody knew her name, but ironically, at the end of the story in Mark's gospel, it says that wherever in the whole world this gospel and this story is told, uh, actually it says where this gospel is preached in the whole world, it will be in memory of her, the nameless woman. And then third in Mark, the authenticity of the outrage expressed over the cost of pure nard or whatever it was uh, that could have fed many is never questioned. Whoever expressed that outrage is not named in Mark, and it's more than one person in Mark's story. But in any case, Mark accepts at face value that there was a legitimate value conflict going on. It's not explained, as in John, by a character defect on Judas's part. So to recap these differences, in Mark, the story is told to highlight a nameless woman who did for Jesus, uh, wh what this woman did for Jesus at the moment of serious despair. While in John, the story is told to disparage Judas and set up an explanation of his motivation for betrayal. Now, in both stories, Jesus receives a massage at a low moment in preparation for the torture and agony that await him. To which I say, in the event of decompression, an oxygen mask will appear in front of you. To start the flow of oxygen, pull the mask toward you. Place it firmly over your nose and mouth. Secure the elastic band behind your head and breathe normally. If you are traveling with children or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask first and then assist the other person. <laughs> now obviously, there's more than one moral to the massage story. Uh, and it greatly depends on who tells it and why it's told. But my take on it is this. 
Sometimes self-care comes first. I put that in the category with the great commandment, which is significant, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. For many of us, that may not be very good loving because we often are much better at loving our neighbors than we are at loving ourselves. I mean, you know your neighbor is imperfect, and you look past it, uh, sometimes with mercy, sometimes with humor. But accepting our own imperfections and actually loving our neighbors in full, or I'm sorry, accepting our own imperfections and actually loving ourselves in full acknowledgement and full acceptance of those imperfections, that's hard duty for many of us. So arriving at that place where we can accept massage, whether it is physical or emotional or spiritual, in the presence of so much greater need all around us, is like securing our mask first and then assisting people around us. Well, that's all I got on the Judas versus massage therapist. I'm going to move on to chapter 2. That poem from Isaiah is a perfect example of naming hope. Naming hope is both the balm and the mission for any of us who would be agents of gospel wisdom. Isaiah is one of the greatest poets and prophets of hope the world has ever known. He wrote, do not remember the former, do not remember the former things, or consider things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's Isaiah speaking for God about doing a new thing, about God doing a new thing. Now something we need to know about this prophetic vision is that it was voiced at the lowest, darkest moment in the history of ancient Israel. Isaiah lights a candle and refuses to listen to any more groaning or grief. In his inimitable poetic style, Isaiah figuratively lifts up his hands and says to the imagined crowd of grieving voices that is encircling him, Stop! Just stop! God is about to do a new thing. Stop and listen. Now, very few people, then or now, believe that God can do a new thing. Most of us don't believe we can do a new thing. You and I do not have the capacity to imagine what could or might be hoped for. The bandwidth of our imagination is just not that wide. We simply do not know what to hope for. And so when we do hope for specific outcomes, they are almost always the wrong ones or the too small ones. Just to put a little flesh on his long dead bones, let me remind us what those ancients had been through uh, at the time in which Isaiah is offering his poetry. Now, as they understood their own history, they had been saved from slavery in Egypt by God. They had been lost in the wilderness for 40 years and then saved by God. They had survived the wilderness and been given a legal constitution by God. It was a constitution that showed them precisely how to create a just and equitable society authorized by God. So they had been given a land flowing with milk and honey and the opportunity to build a society for former slaves that was merciful and just. All of it given by God. But eventually, their revolution became a dictatorship, and their sovereign nation was torn by civil war, dividing it north and south. Diminished in size and stature, 
They were invaded and occupied by predatory empires. Finally, they were destroyed and taken away in exile to live in servitude and captives in Babylon. In slavery, once again, they lost their hope because clearly they had been abandoned by God. They could not be Israel in a foreign land. They could not be Israel without the beloved temple and the holy city. They could not be Israel without the promised land. Into the dark of that total despair, Isaiah says, God is about to do a new thing and bring us home. <laughs> now those exiles would have believed Isaiah about as much as the grievous and scared disciples hiding in the upper room would ever have believed that Jesus would come to be known around the whole world. Even in the best of times, we don't know what to hope for. And the courage of our hope is not powerful enough to hope for what can happen. But here's an odd thing. What Isaiah told them to hope for actually did come to pass. Now I'm not making any bold claim about God doing the new thing that Isaiah voiced, but I am just observing history. Suddenly hope, which would have seemed ludicrous before the poetic vision, came to pass, that hope came to pass, that what seemed to be a naive and uh, ludicrous po uh, poetry of hope came true. Now, for the moment, let's just reject the idea that God, uh, you know, manipulates armies and historical forces so that some people are winners and some are losers. Let's just accept uh, that such an idea may have seemed splendid uh, a, a splendid explanation in the ancient world, but it's a bucket with holes in it in our world. Instead, let's just think about Isaiah sitting in the bowels of the Babylonian Empire, which was one of the more ruthless empires in human history. And there he was, surrounded by those who, were, who had contracted an all-consuming grief. He must have been at risk of getting that grief himself with the misery and hopelessness all enveloping him. And yet, somehow, somehow, he was able to still see hope. Like an aperture letting in light, hope gave him vision, and hope allowed him to see something his contemporaries could not see. So even if we say, from our perch on history, that it was not God that brought the Persians to power, who then allowed the captives to return to the Promised Land and rebuild, we can still see something amazing. Even if we acknowledge that it wasn't God, still Isaiah was able to see historical forces at work that would create an opportunity and bring about a new day? How did he see, how did he see the new, in the new, that was, how did he see the new that was coming into the world when everyone else just saw grim and growing darkness? He saw it, he spoke it, he held it up, he fed it. So here is chapter 3 and the conclusion. I know a lot of people who follow our particular brand of Christianity who are focused like a laser on outreach, concrete, measurable acts of goodness like feeding, clothing, and housing people in need. Now I'm not going to argue against that, obviously, but I am going to argue that's not our primary mission. In fact, it's at least third on the list of mission items for agents of gospel wisdom. First on our list is that our community of faith, our communities of faith, 
and those of us in it are to be an oxygen mask. First and foremost, we are to be a people and a place in which we can breathe and receive life that enables us to live life more abundantly, which includes, of course, caring for other people. But first it includes accepting love and learning how to love ourselves so that we can learn then to love others also. Now the clash of values that took place with bitterness between Jesus and Judas and John's story is still a hot flame in many congregations today. But I say it's not either or, it's both and. And yet there is a first place and a third place in this pecking order. And second place goes to hope. Our mission is to be agents of hope in which we see possibilities when everybody else sees only despair. It's not necessarily the ability to see and know what's going to happen or even what should happen. Rather, it is the courage and imagination to see light piercing the darkness and to know that a new possibility that has, hasn't even been thought of yet is coming our way. To be agents of hope in our world is tough duty, but our communities of faith must be places we can practice and develop hearts and minds that host that kind of courageous hope. So first, we need to be an oxygen mask for one another. Secondly, we need to be a petri dish for hope. And third, we need to sell some of that pure nard and fun family promise or center of concern or whatever else other acts of goodness we want to support. So now, look at that. There was a sermon in three parts. I haven't done that in a long time. Peace be with you.